Hello, and welcome to another episode of Test, Optimize, and Scale. It's an honor to have Victoria Yampolsky here today with us, uh, founder and president of the Startup Station. They focus on uh, entrepreneurial raises, fundraising, uh, Victoria's background as an entrepreneur, also working in post-fundraising uh, from a financial perspective. Uh, really got my attention as they've worked with over 100 founders directly. Uh, Victoria's curriculum has then worked with over 1,000 founders. So uh, excited to talk processes, structures, and overall fundraising here today. Victoria, thanks for joining. Very excited to be here, Jason. Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. Excellent. And uh, we were just talking a bit about all the moving pieces there are in a successful fundraise. Want to get into that, but figured we could start with your story and uh, connect the audience to, to more of your background. Sure. Well, I didn't wake up one day and started the startup station. That is not quite what happened, even though I would probably have liked to tell us such a straightforward story. Uh, but what really happened was that um, I started as a computer science major. I went to Cornell University, and then in my junior year, I really figured out that I did not want to be a programmer. And so instead, I went to IT consulting, where I became a business analyst. And again, I was in the environment where I was too connected with the technology, and I started wanting to learn finance, and I couldn't switch because of my background. So I went to business school, and then I went to Wall Street. And even there, I was still dissatisfied with looking for passion and looking for something that made me, uh, you know, excited. And um, I actually quit my job on Wall Street after learning a lot and working with a lot of companies and across multiple industries. I was lucky to be in the group which allowed me an opportunity to do so. And I decided to be an entrepreneur. And my first venture was actually in the film industry because I have an acting background as a child and I wanted to get into something creative. And I decided being the first time entrepreneur and fresh out of all this Ivy League colleges, I thought I'm a very big shot with all my experiences. I decided to raise $165 million for a slate of film without really having any experience. Um, in the film industry, I did get a producer, but of course she didn't have an experience which would be uh, justified for a budget that size. And like my team did not justify a budget that size, et cetera. And so for the next two years, I did try and I got to some point, but eventually, of course, for this and many reasons, this venture did not work out. And this was very traumatic, but I think it's a, a, almost a building experience for an entrepreneur to go through this growth opportunity and to realize all the mistakes that you make that so that you don't have to make them again. And so that hopefully maybe you can even tell others to be uh, on the watch out for those mistakes. So, you know, only after that point, okay, after I tried my hand in entrepreneurship and miserably failed, and then I didn't really know what to do next, I then thought, okay, well, I already worked with film producers, and I realized that they are not business people, like they are passionate about their projects, but they have no idea about how to bring it to market, how to distribute it, et cetera. And then I started talking to some startup founders, and I realized that they're the same way. They are passionate about their creation, whether it's in a product or technology, they want to change the world. And they very have oftentimes very little idea in terms of how to do it and how to get the capital that will allow them to get to the stage. And so voila, the startup station has been born. It began as a consulting company where I work with founders and helping them put financials together. And it grew to be an education platform, an advisory platform where we also provide courses, which, you know, like you mentioned, a thousand, more than a thousand founders took our curriculum and learned themselves how to build financial models for their fundraising process, as well as value their companies. And we now also provide support to companies post fundraising so that they can implement the models that they put together into practice and react faster to market feedback. So it's been quite a journey and I definitely, you know, learned a lot along the way and I'm extremely happy to discuss some of my learnings and some of the processes that have worked successfully for me and my clients uh, in terms of how to set up your financials and how to build your financial modeling, and how to use them as business intelligence tools to uh, build better businesses and to be successful. Very nice. So you have this background, success in some major fundraises, identifying holes in different industries and opportunities for improvement. You've now built this curriculum 
uh, these these structures to be able to take founders through uh, and be able to, to streamline and avoid some of the mistakes that you were able to uh, identify that were consistent among founders um, well, you know, through this the, the, these uh, steps. So when we talk about the fundraising process, right, the most difficult companies to model are the ones that don't have any revenues, right? This is a very difficult program, problem because we don't have any financial data. Right, so how do we get around it is that we focus on go-to-market strategy and we model the company's drivers or strategic decisions and then the business logic in terms of how those decisions convert into financial data. Okay, and so this allows us to produce revenues which are justifiable and show a path to profitability. And so the most common mistakes that I see is that it's not done this way. There's two common ways of how people model revenues when you don't have any data. Number one is people assume an arbitrary growth rate and they just say, okay, well, my users are gonna grow at, let's say initially 100% because we're starting with very small numbers and then it's gonna decrease to 50% and 25%, etc. cetera, right? The, or, okay, so this is one approach, or they can say, okay, well, our addressable market is, let's say $1 billion. Well, initially, I'm going to capture 0.001% of this market, and then it's going to increase, okay? And it all seems fine, right? It's all logical, except it's not linked to the company strategy, marketing strategy specifically, which you guys are specializing in. It's not linked to the cost of customer acquisitions. It's not linked to the sales cycle if we're dealing with B2B companies, and it's not linked to the capital constraints, which will be necessary to determine if the revenue goals that you set for yourself are achievable given where you are from the financial perspective. And so when people do it this way, they produce financials that are essentially useless and do not help investors in evaluating their business and in fact hurt the founders' credibility in the fundraising process because they present the plan, right? Because what is, what are, what is the financial model, right? It's not the crystal ball. You can't look into the future and somehow through a financial psychic, you know, guess how much the company is going to make and what your company is worth, right? That's not the purpose of the financial model. And maybe there are some people who, you know, do that, but, you know, that's, that's wrong, right? That's not the purpose of a financial model. The purpose of a financial model is to translate your strategy into a clear financial roadmap, allow you to evaluate its financial feasibility, determine milestones which you will need to take to get to certain financial goals, help you understand the cost, and help you understand how to measure success, right? So it's a plan, right? And so if you present investors with a plan that is not justified, that's not linked to what you're actually going to do, to how much it's going to cost, is this plan worth anything? No, right? And so that is the reason why a lot of VCs or a lot of angel investors throw out financials that startup founders put in front of them because they can't really verify what is happening. And so we correct sure. this problem by going through this, you know, framework of ours that we built, which converts the company's business plan into a financial plan in a credible way. The other very common mistake that I see is that uh, founders do not consider working capital. Okay. And so there is a difference between your operating expenses, which is, let's say your brand, your marketing expenses, your salaries, in your working capital, okay? Even though it kind of sounds like the same thing, but it's not the same thing. So the working capital is the capital that you need to run your company because there are differences in the timing when you get a cash flow and the timing when you book uh, revenue or you incur a cost. For example, if you're a product company, you first have to spend money on inventory before you can sell it, right? If you have to produce inventory before the point of sale. If you work with businesses, you may have to extend the payment terms. So you will already have conducted service and you've had to pay people to perform that service, but you will only get revenues for that later. Because of these differences in cash flow, you have an additional liquidity need, which you need to account for when you determine how much money you need to raise to run your business for whatever period of time you're raising money for, whether it's 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months. And because typically startup founders don't know finance very well, they miss that, right? And as a result, they underestimate the amount of capital they need to raise. And, not, and then I would say the third major mistake is that they do not plan for contingency. And a contingency is very important 
because as much as we want to believe that we can estimate the future, what tends to happen is that we overlook some of the costs, we underestimate some of the costs, we think things are going to happen on one time when it happens, you know, twice as long or three times as long, etc. And we may end up in a situation where we don't have enough capital, we're not reaching our goals, and we have to go back to investors and say, look, like we are in a situation where we need more cash. In order not to do that, you have a contingency, which is typically 10 to 20% of the amount that you want to raise to forecast for the unexpected. This is uh, an advice for absolutely any budget and any raise, regardless of whether you are pre-revenue or revenue, uh, because you may have the situations uh, all the time. It's very difficult to predict for something like that. And if you don't need a contingency, then you leave it for growth or you leave it for other needs. This is just the cash that you're going to raise to allow yourself some buffer for mistakes. Okay, so a lot of information to unravel there. I want to start at the beginning where you're talking about essentially vanity metrics in people's financials. They're not the financial roadmap that you're describing. Uh, they're not an algorithmic pattern that a VC or a third party can really dive into and understand the workings of a business as much as here's what the industry is producing. And if we get 1%, we're going to be billionaires as much as, hey, how exactly is this business running? I like to say the only way to measure is with numbers. Uh, we're doing it more from an advertising, a marketing growth uh, perspective uh, for, for investor acquisition uh, even. We're, we're still talking about return on ad spend and these different multipliers. But I need to see an algorithm. I need to see impressions, clicks, conversions. How many times is a piece of content seen? How much traffic? How many conversions are occurring from that as I'm doing digital fundraising, I imagine you just have a field day when looking at some of the finances they try to submit. And uh, I love how you talked about, you know, what are the costs? What are the movable pieces? Uh, there's a saying where if you could touch it, you can move it. And if you can move it, you can manage it and manage it to a point of effectiveness. But if you can, if it's all just a blur, if it's all just, uh, you know, numbers to make people look good, it's not productive for anyone. Absolutely. And it doesn't help founders when they begin executing on that plan. They can't really call it a real plan uh, uh, either because they don't really have a roadmap which they can use to evaluate whether or not their strategy is working and to respond faster to market feedback, to pivot, to make the changes. And because founders initially have, and I mean, at the, any point that they raise additional amounts of capital, they only have a limited time and they have a limited amount of cash they don't really have an ability to make a lot of mistakes, right? If they make too many mistakes, they're gonna fail. And because they don't have the tool to help them, they put themselves in a position where it's more difficult for them to succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is just another way, of course, it's not the only way to make them succeed, right? But it is a very important way for absolutely any business to get a real, um, you know, look into what is going on and the real understanding of how what you're doing from the management perspective connects to financial results. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, founders are, um, I wouldn't even necessarily call them, they do have egos, a lot of sure. them, um, and that's the, the reason why some of them may not succeed because they don't listen to other people. And some of them, um, because they don't know finance, they could be um, just unaware of how much things cost how uh, long things take, how to present your idea to somebody who does look at numbers and who does understand finance and who uses finance as a major decision point when they uh, make making investments or when they're making decisions because their brain thinks differently and they don't haven't yet learned the translation process of how to translate what they're thinking, what they're dreaming, especially if they're very technical into something, into, I guess, another language, which is finance, which is what investors speak. So you always have two people speaking who may not understand each other very well, and yet one group who are founders wants something from another group, which are investors, right? So they need to speak the same language, and that language is a pitch back, right, where you tell a story about why you started the company and how you want to grow it and where it needs to go and how you're going to get there. And then it needs to get concrete in terms of, okay, well, what does it mean in real life? What does it mean in terms of revenue goals? What does it mean in terms of amount of capital required? What does it mean in terms of when they're going to start making money? And that's mm -hmm. finance. And so there's basically two ways in which they communicate. If founders come to investors and they start talking about a C++ cool algorithm that they wrote, that conversation isn't going to go very far. 
because the investor may not know C++ and will get very quickly lost in the intricacies of that language and like whatever, however, no matter how brilliant this algorithm mm -hmm. is. But the numbers will speak loudly to that investor with their financial the numbers, background. The numbers will if they can justify them. And I think the issue is that there's actually two problems. Um, uh, as I say, so there are some technical problems in how the numbers are produced that we've talked about that. Okay, and then there's some, uh, I would say, attitude problems. Uh, so uh, there are some founders who are very optimistic about what they can achieve, right? So the way how they formulate assumptions, right? Because I mean, what is the model? The model has two parts. You have some inputs and then you have mm -hmm. some formulas which convert inputs into outputs. And the outputs is the financial data that we present. So you formulate inputs and inputs for a financial model come from three places, right? It's only three places, which is kind of cool uh, to understand. So one place is your strategy, such as, for example, the price for the product or the size of the marketing budget or how you're going to allocate it or when you're going to launch different revenue streams, et cetera, right? Or how you're going to design your pricing. And if you have several customer groups, you may design a different price for every customer group and stuff like that. Second is uh, an industry norm. So if you don't have any data, then you take an industry norm. For example, you're launching a new service and you're going to use a digital marketing strategy to get there. You may take a conversion rate specific to that channel because it's typically not specific to the product. And then the third place, of course, right, as you get some data, then you replace all assumptions with what actually happens except your strategy mm -hmm. assumptions. And then you have basically a combination of something like how your business is doing, which is then fed into this business logic mechanism, an algorithm, a financial algorithm, which produces the result of the company should realize. And so uh, a lot of the founders, okay, are too optimistic on the inputs, which results in outputs that they can justify. And again, it puts them in a position which is not credible in front of investors. Okay, that's one category of founders. And then there is another category of founders that are very, um, not sure in themselves and they only want to put the numbers that they absolutely know like it's the people that are in the pipeline and this is what they think it's going to be for the next 10 years and whatever and when you do that then you don't present an attractive enough plan to investors you don't position yourself as a growth investment and again you put yourself in a situation where investors don't find you attractive but for a different reason and then discards you completely so the solution is to build your financial plan correctly, to look at its financial feasibility and to make sure that your projections are conservative, but yet, right, conservative meaning justifiable. You can stand behind every number, you understand how you're going to execute on this number, but yet you present from the overall perspective an attractive investment from the financial point of view. So when investors look at it, they say, yeah, I want to invest in this company. And because of this plan, I see that the risk is managed. I understand how things are going to be done and when we can intervene or make some changes. If things sure. Sure. And I like how you categorize uh, the different psychologies of the founders and how they like to position it too conservatively, too aggressively, uh, how that can counter act, uh, you know, have the adverse effect over time uh, to their actual uh, intention. So I like how you spelled that all out. And I, I emphasize revenue. You talked about that earlier. And I know there's the whole user game in terms of valuation and there's different business models, of course. Uh, but we work with uh, an accelerator that's really focused around SaaS, uh, a few that are, are more focused, software as a service, a few that are more focused around these digital B2B models where there's a high amount of revenue coming through with each user. We work with other groups that are more mobile apps, but they still want to place a valuation on the user. And we could look at that as, you know, some calculation for, for you know, towards their valuation um, if there's actual ways to monetize that user. So I, I see that missed a lot and then founders in a, an ongoing game of capital raising and not set up for it. I've seen others that are, are beautifully positioned for it and are very successful at their B round, their C round, so on and so forth. Uh, but I like how you talked about working capital. It's amazing to me how much a burn rate needs to be emphasized to founders and what is actually uh, included, you know, with, with, with taxes and with this and with that and all these different moving pieces of employees or, you know, insurances, whatever may be involved there. Can you speak a little bit about working capital and what you like to uh, really uh, discuss, educate uh, founders on during that stage uh, of your system? 
Sure. So, uh, uh, like I've mentioned, the working capital. So, let me uh, make a quick clarification. The burn rate is a monthly fixed cost, right? And the fixed cost are operating cost of your business, meaning that they will not vary with the level of your sales, right? So, do you will incur these costs even if you make no money? Because these are just the costs to run your business. And it's very important to make a distinction as fixed does not mean constant. It's just fixed to the level of revenues. And then there is, of course, another type of cost, which are variable, which vary with the level of revenues. And for example, if you're selling products, this will be the cost of goods sold, right? The, if you're selling t-shirts, it will be the cost to produce a t-shirt. That's a variable cost. But then if you have an office out of which you conduct the sales of t-shirts, this will be the fixed cost because you have to have an office. No matter if you have one t-shirt or 500 t-shirts, you'll still have an office. You can then get a larger office or smaller office, but whatever that cost is for a certain period of time, that's the cost you're going to have to incur. So the burn rate refers to the fixed cost. My uh, working capital is a different cost, okay? And then there's three situations in which you're going to have that occurring for your start. Number one, uh, it's inventory, okay? So if you're a product startup, and if you don't have the on-demand inventory, meaning that you would only produce it if it's bought, right? If you have to accumulate inventory before you make a sale, then you will have to incur a cash outflow to make those products before you can collect revenue from them. And this will generate a liquidity need for you, right? So this is a negative uh, cash um, um, impact. On your, on your capital, right? Because this is the use, use of funds. The second one, which is a negative um, uh, use of funds is accounts receivable, right? And this is the credit that you extend to your customers, okay? What does it happen is because typically happens when you work with B2B customers, enterprises, where you may have the payment terms of anywhere from 30 days to 180 days. What does it mean for you? It means that you sold them a product, okay? And even in the worst case scenario, your cycle may even be more because if it's an inventory situation where you had to also produce the product two months in advance before you sold it, and then let's say you had to wait three months more to collect the money, you're waiting five months to collect the cash that you spent in month one, okay? And this is called the cash conversion cycle, which you need to consider when you're thinking about your liquidity needs. So the working capital is an additional consideration to how much money you need to operate your business in terms of understanding how much capital your business needs to operate because of certain business decisions that you make, right? So not every company is going to have inventory and not every company is going to work with B2B clients where you will have payment terms. So it may not be applicable to you. You may also have several revenue streams where those situations will only arise for some of them, but not for others. For example, if you have several products and only some of them will be for enterprise clients and some of them will be for smaller clients where you can collect payment at the point of sale. And the third situation is actually favorable to you. It's called accounts payable. And this is in reverse when you are the one getting credit from your suppliers. So what often product companies try to do is to match payment terms so that they actually uh, don't have to pay to their suppliers until they make a sale, right? So they shorten the cash conversion cycle. So in this case, let's say we take this example that I gave before, where it takes you have to spend the money to make your inventory two months in advance. If you negotiate 60-day terms with your suppliers, you will actually shorten your cash conversion cycle to just three months when you extend trade to your customers instead of five months in the worst scenario where you have to pay everybody else at the point of sale, but then you're waiting from your customers for three months to collect it. So that's what working capital is for a startup. For um, bigger companies, there's a few more items that go into calculating it, but the all deal around the fact that you may incur some costs, which you have to pay uh, either later okay which conserves cash for you or you may book some revenues which you can collect right away which creates a liquidity interesting cash. so breaking it down with the inventory the accounts receivable the accounts payable what that means and uh really was glad to see contingency as part of it as well too you know we talk about problem solving so much here at dna 
uh, as a marketing agency, I haven't defined good marketing talent as good problem solving abilities. And that doesn't always show up in the financials. So to be able to have that extra 10 to 20%, and like you said, if it's not needed, fantastic. Now we could use it towards growth. There's a lot of different uh, investments a business can make from that point, whether it's in advertising or a variety of different assets or you know, perhaps uh, you know, operations as a whole. Uh, but, but planning for that is uh, you know, really just profound in my eyes as I don't always see it as part of the use of proceeds. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, especially with marketing, I mean, you are the, the whole um, name of your podcast is test, right? Because without testing, you don't really know what works. Similarly, with product development, without testing some features, you don't know what's going to work from the UX perspective. Or even when you're launching certain new services from the business model perspective, you don't know what works. So testing and actually um, budgeting for testing and understanding how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take and what are the, uh, how much money are you willing to spend on this, right? Before you make a decision, if it doesn't reach the desired result, you either change direction or maybe you increase, like, you know, what happens? What are you, what is the risk? What is the risk in the financial perspective that you're trying to take? And what is the business goal that you're trying to achieve? That is very important to think through because it um, allows for more responsible decision-making and in fact, it also um, reduces uh, stress because you know there's so much uncertainty in the entrepreneurial world and that uh, people need to make decisions without having a lot of information, without having all the information that they need. If you create this framework where, okay, I'm gonna, this is, these are the tests that I need to run in order to understand X. Based on the conclusion on this test that I'm gonna run for X amount of time and this is my total budget. If I get this result, I do X. And if I don't get this result, I do Y. It helps with, even um, psychologically eat up the cost of something not working out because you've already allowed for that possibility and you've already budgeted for this and it's all part of the overall plan to get to a desired point. And if you get market feedback on, let's say, strategy that's not working faster, that's money saved in a way because you only spend a little bit money on testing as opposed to money wasted. And uh, you know, as you're going through... Uh, discussions with the founder and speaking to the the fundraising side you know we're working on a high volume of these equity crowdfunding campaigns targeting retail investors and accredited investors i know the accredited investor conversations have a longer sales cycle there's a lot more complexity to them uh, what do you recommend to a founder how, what is your advice for them in terms of how to structure their fundraise what to test out and uh, you know where to begin. So um, I would say uh, that um, the step one of the process would be to prepare for fundraise. Okay, mm. and I would say that that has two parts to it. One part is to prepare your documents, which would be your pitch deck, your executive summary, your financial model. Why? Because I mean, this is something that you're going to be selling, right? This is something that you will be presenting to investors. And if you don't have that ready, no conversation is gonna go to any point of, that you would like. And the second part uh, would be to have your legal foundation ready. So a lot of the founders are not incorporated or have proper agreements in place. Their IP is not, um, if their, their IP is not assigned to the company, that may create an issue. Employment agreements may not be done. There's a lot of issues which makes them actually not unable to take any capital. Sometimes they're incorporated as an LLC or an S corp, which is also not a desired entity for a fundraise, which would be C corp, etc. So I would say that you need to be prepared both from the investor prep documents perspective and the legal perspective, okay? And then you need to think about your marketing because then you need to think about, okay, who are, what are the investors that I'm trying to reach, right? Who am I trying to target and how am I going to get there, right? And then uh, there you need to think about, okay, when you're thinking about which investors you'd like to uh, have on your uh, as part of your uh, investment round, you need to think about your stage, right? Are you uh, you know how much capital you're raising? You need to think about investors that may specialize in your geography, industry. Let's say if you're a woman founder, if you're a diversity founder, you might have some investors that would be specifically supporting those segments. And then you also need to think about um, are they interested in specific um, you know social impact issues or something that you know would make them more uh, enticed in your if this is if this is your situation in in your startup when you have those criteria uh, understood right so who are the investors that i'm looking for 
then you go and you search for them and you create this investor pipeline of investors who you would like to reach okay but before you go out and you try to reach your dream investor you reach out you know test you test how people react to your value proposition so you put together some emails where you specify what you want and you send them out to i would say if we're talking about the scale of one to ten somebody who's like two to five okay somebody who you're not so interested in okay you're going to send them some emails and you want to see what they say you want to see the response you want to see the questions that they ask you that you may or may not have addressed and you want to use this feedback to hone your value proposition to hone your communication to hone yes. how you present yourself to then go to highly desired and the more expanded list and then full force and i think another i think it's wonderful that there are all these platforms which can connect startup founders with investors and of course you know how you present yourself as you know is extremely important and so you would test and then you then optimize and then i guess i described the scaling is when you're going to go out to the entire pipeline and see what happens and if you're able uh to use a warm introduction if you're if you, there is an investor that you really like if you're able to connect with them maybe another way except just through the platform they can also help you because um you know uh, people trust if it comes from a vetted source they trust that introduction more and if it's somebody who you're really interested in it may be worth that extra step and if you're not using a platform if you're doing a race you know on your own i would say absolutely try to get the introduction through somebody because it can save you a lot of time cold outreach has a much lower it just it just takes longer and it has uh just a longer cycle because people don't know you and then when it doesn't come from a better source it may uh, uh you may have to send a lot a lot more emails for a lot longer to get the response absolutely and uh i really like the uh the closed feedback loop where you're speaking to investors shaping your offering from there as, as a digital uh leg of these type of efforts it's often missed it's either hey is this working okay we're targeting the wrong audience when oftentimes it's asking the audience, there's no mystery. Hey, hey, why is this not a good offering? What could we change about it? How could we mix up the narrative? And really asking the buyer, you know, what would make this sellable? Uh, there'll always be a conversion rate, so we wouldn't be expecting, you know, buy off every one of those uh, groups coming back. And then intros. Everything is relationships. So being able to uh, talk to the referral partner at that getting a better sense of if the uh, the group would move forward on this. Uh, but I do want to ask about optimizing. And I, I like to think of optimizing uh, when things are not working. There's certainly optimization towards doing more of what is producing. Uh, but what happens when a founder goes through that and they're not raising funds? How do you recommend them maybe pivoting or at least optimizing uh, their approach or overall messaging? So um, the most frequent reason why um, startups are not raising funds is because they try to raise before they become investable, mm. right? What does it mean? That they go before they have enough traction or they try to raise too much money that justified by the stage where they are, right? So again, it's a, an optimistic um, mindset. And for some founders, which let's say if Elon Musk wakes up tomorrow and he goes to any VC and he says, I need you know $20 million and I want to go to another galaxy, he will get $20 million, right? Because he has a track record, okay? However, many founders do not have a track record, right? Of understanding what they need to do to get there, which is why they need to build it. That is why startups need to get a certain stage, whether it's in terms of a product or in terms of customers who express interest to indicate to investors that they can execute on the plan. And then the market, uh, does demand whatever it is that they're creating. So a very common problem is that there's not enough that they've done in their startup to assuage investors' concerns about execution risk. And execution risk is the highest risk in terms of why startups can fail, I mean, among like, many others. This is this is a big one. So I would say this is the first one. So if, you consider, so if you're going out and you're raising capital and you're constantly getting no's, I think asking why is critical, right? Just like when you're talking to customers and you're asking, do you like my product? What do you like about it? Why do you not like about it? You use this feedback to improve, right? You use this feedback to understand your customer pain points. And that's probably how you came up with your product in the first uh, you know, sense, right? Because you understood that there was a problem that wasn't being solved. If investors have a problem that you're not solving, 
in the way how you're presenting your value proposition, you need to understand it and correct it. And this problem can be where your company is. It can be the messaging. This is one is easier to correct, right? And so the messaging is you understand what is it that that's not clear to them. Okay, this is the simplest problem, right? They say, that, oh, I need this information. I don't understand how you're going to do X. And you actually have the information and you can do it. So you can just include this in your material so you can tweak your value proposition so that you present yourself from a more attractive point of view. And then there is a, um, you know, a third one where um, it's not that you don't have attraction or that it's not that your materials are not beautiful. It's just like your business sucks. Okay, that's also possible. Like, you know, there's no product market fit, right? Investors do not see potential. You're trying to break it to the industry where it doesn't make sense. Like something in your core value proposition is not working. Okay, that is when you can pivot. Okay, so it's no idea is perfect when you conceive it, right? When you conceive it, you think, oh my God, I'm a genius, right? I'm Einstein. But, you know, even Einstein went through a process of self-discovery before he figured out how the universe works. So your idea could be good, but you can come up with even better idea once you understand the market realities, right? And so if you're consistently getting negative feedback, that could be a way, you know, like a push for you to do just that. And then, and again, how do you know what to do? Listen to feedback, listen to market feedback and listen to investors feedback. If you have an advisory board, ask them, right? Ask people who really understand mm. your business. What is it that's working? What's not working and why? The simplest things to fix are the ones that everything is working, just not presented well. And I understand that you guys uh, can help with that pretty masterfully. So. Absolutely. <laughs> and we don't know out of the gate. I, I would be uh, over-promising to say if I, if I did. For us, it's all about variant tests, A-B tests. Let's look at this messaging. Let's look at that messaging. Uh, generally, four to ten of those. But comparatively, where are we seeing the results? And there is a trend that will emerge from the numbers. It's all back uh, to the analytics there. So uh, I like those recommendations and, and you know some of the hard aspects to grasp about that, of course, as a founder. Uh, but I think that's very constructive. And what about scale? Do you have any success stories that you can share, or what tr you know what, what commonalities have you seen in the groups that have been the most effective at you know getting their initial round of capital? I know you guys stay on and continue to advise on financial programs, financial models, post fundraising. What is the recommendation towards how to scale? Sure. So um, I would say when I see a successful raise, okay, um, there's two things that are common. A, it's an experienced team. Everybody wants an experienced team, a well, you know, put together team because right it results in a better plan the company is probably a little bit further along and um it reduces execution risk so the team the teams that are well put together have a higher chance of raising money typically of course it's easier to raise money if you have some revenues because again it gives investors confidence that there is a demand in the market and i mean in the absence of that okay how do you raise funds for example at the earliest stages you um you have to be able to tell a story you have to present good materials and a good plan because at that point that's the only thing they can go on right and you need to if you can't build a team yet you know you have, let's say two people or three people you can build a very good advisory board which will substitute all the gaps that you uh have because you don't have a full team built so I would say those companies that have, um, you know, those criteria, they're successful in raising money. And sometimes it's a journey. You know, I have a founder um, which did not give up and could afford to um, work in her company for four years. And she's only now raised when she's pivoted a few times. Right. So it's also, I would say this, if you can't raise, right, you can, um, you basically have two choices, right? One is, and you know, you stop, right? That's it. Like it didn't work out. You go do something else. The other one is you don't stop and you try to make it work, right? And actually those founders who have the second approach where you have grit and resilience and um, conviction that they can do it, they themselves can do it, whereas this business or another business, those are the ones who succeed, right? Because then you look for ways to make it work and you also have the self-awareness, right? And the problem is that you could be wrong, right? If you Because if you're in a headspace where you cannot be wrong, then yes, maybe you'll get lucky one time, but for sure, 
there'll be a situation where uh, it will not happen. So I would say that those founders that have those personal qualities and that are able, and as a result, they're actually able to get their businesses to the point where they become investable, they're the ones who um, raise money. Of course, you need to have a good idea, et cetera, et cetera, right? But many founders have good ideas and never succeed because of uh, some, other, some other impediments. Now, but in terms of if we're gonna talk about businesses, you know, uh, how do you grow? So, just raising money this is just the beginning of somebody's journey towards the stocks right because then you need to execute and then you need to scale the company and i would say that um not having the right processes in place and not having the right culture in place can significantly impediment on the success of a company so if you don't build the right infrastructure i'm not just talking about uh infrastructure from a financial perspective even though that's critical because it gives you you know insight into how your business is doing you don't build your operational processes correctly. If you don't build the right culture, which will allow you to attract the right people, you're not going to be able to beat this built ship, right? That will sail into the a harbor, which I will call the exit, right, or whatever the end goal for your company is, uh, because it takes a lot, right? And if you, uh, yes, you know, you may be able to get a lot of company uh, customers, but if you can't service them, you're going to lose them, and that's going to be the end of your company. Right? Or you can get a lot of users, but if your platform isn't set up technologically to handle them, that's going to be the end of your business. So as you're building your plans and as you're building your financial plans and operational plans, you have to think about scaling. And it's only those companies that are able to build those infrastructures as well as adjust um, their expertise because the expertise that you need to run your company at the one to two million dollar level it's very different from the expertise you need to run your company mm -hmm. at the 10 to 20 million dollar level and then a hundred million plus so as an executive you need to be able to get the right people on your team to execute on the new strategy and deal with the new challenges right and then and it, actually not everybody can do it right but you almost have to scale as an executive with your company and so i think that culture which are the people and processes and the management team itself which their vision you know needs to be scalable are the three um testaments of success from my perspective and uh you're absolutely right it, it really does change at each stage and success at this raise level looks completely different from the organization that's raising on the next round and what's needed to accomplish those objectives it certainly sounds like uh, you know you get to hear it all. You get to work with groups at all sides of the the spectrum and uh, be able to provide recommendations and uh, produce effective results from there. And Victoria, we really have gone over a lot today. Uh, if any listeners are uh, you know curious to speak with you further, uh, you know get an understanding of the startup station and even work with you directly. What would be the best next steps for them? What is your preferred method of communication? How could they get in touch with you? Of course. So um, you're welcome to go on my site, uh, www.thestartupstation.com. You can sign up to the mailing list to get um, uh, news of constantly events that we're doing on new programs. We have events every two weeks on different topics. You can follow me on LinkedIn, the Startup Station, or if you'd like to speak with me directly, you can write to me at victoria at the startupstation.com. I always have time for founders for a conversation, so please reach out to me with any questions, and I will be happy to speak to you about your challenges or even provide motivational support as somebody who has gone through a lot of stuff as an entrepreneur myself, even not necessarily from the financial perspective. And uh, definitely encourage listeners to do that. Uh, Victoria, you've been a wealth of knowledge today. Uh, I want to thank you for, for coming on. And um, yeah, just thank you for your time. I, I appreciate it. I'm sure the audience is going to be responding warmly here. Thank you so much Jason, for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to do it with you guys. Absolutely. And everyone who's uh, tuned in, thank you uh, for joining us. I uh, hope to see you next time and uh, recommend putting in these different financial structures that Victoria has recommended uh, in place as soon as possible. Thanks again. We'll see you next we time. We can help you do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Startup Station uh, should definitely be involved in that. So uh, thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time.